Thank you, Deputy President. No, Deputy Speaker. <laughs> I need to make the transition from one house to the other. It is a great honour and privilege to be standing in the Legisl Legislative Assembly of the Western Australian Parliament as the member for Hillary's. I praise God for the magnificent blessings he has bestowed on my family and on me throughout our lives. I pay respect to our Sovereign and I thank Her Excellency the Governor for addressing us at the opening of Parliament. I congratulate the Speaker on his election to the position and I point out that the Speaker and I have three very important things in common. We both have a very good name, a great name. We both saw the light and moved to this wonderful state from Victoria. And most important of all, we both support the mighty Collingwood Football Club. I congratulate every member of parliament for their election to this place. And I sincerely wish the new government the very best because irrespective of which political party we represent, our first and most important duty is to represent the best interests of all Western Australians. That's what I'm here to do and that's what I intend to do for all the time that I am here. This may be the third parliamentary chamber that I have been elected to in my life, but my sense of duty and service to my electorate and to our state does not diminish in the slightest with the passing of the years. The recent election campaign was the toughest I have ever personally been involved in in more than 30 years in politics. Just like every member in this chamber, I chose to go into politics, knowing that politics is a tough game and not one for the faint-hearted. But I did not choose to be subjected to daily vitriolic abuse, to have myself and my family threatened and intimidated, or to be racially abused. No person in Australia in 2017 should have to explain to their children what the term wog means after they had heard that word being yelled at them at a shopping centre by a person who really should know much better. Everyone else seems to have had their say on the Hillary's campaign, except for me and my family. We are expected to grin and bear it, to turn the other cheek or to rise above it all. But I speak up today because death threats, slash tyres and racial abuse do not belong in any part of Australian life. Not now, not ever. I hope no candidate from any party has to endure them ever again. After all, we actually need more good people to put up their hands to run for public office. Despite every obstacle placed in my way, I did manage to get elected. And for that, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to many people. First, of course, to the residents and voters of the seat of Hillary's. Throughout the long and tough campaign, I was heartened and encouraged by so many local people who would come up to me at community events, at the shops, at sporting clubs and at local schools, expressing their support and encouraging me to continue which is why I'm so proud to represent our local area in Parliament. Every single day, I will work diligently to make our area and our state an even better place to live. I will advocate strongly for the things that matter to our local residents, and my office door will always be open to listen to you and assist you in any way I can. A special thank you in all of this must go to my family. My Greek name is not Peter, it's actually Panayotis. But in Greek, the name Peter means rock. In our family, my wife Carolee is my rock and the person who keeps the whole show on the road. She has been an absolutely amazing support to me and I could not have done any of this without you. Thank you, my angel, for everything. The kids, Andrew, Angelica and Zoe, have grown up around politics and their fun-loving nature certainly improves our spirits, even on the darkest days. Uh, Ross and Nicolette, likewise, have lived politics for all of their lives, more than, more than 20 years now, and they have been by my side at all times in support. <clears throat> my parents, Argerios and Nicoletta, are the people who have guided me through my life and instilled in me the values that I still hold true today. Love for family, thrift and savings, respect for other, others, and the certainty that the individual 
who is prepared to work hardest for what they really want will triumph in the end. I also thank my sister Rani and her husband Peter, and I wish them well in the health struggles that they are going through right now. Um, my cousin, Urania Katsimbanis, or Nitsa as we call her, is like a second sister to me and an indispensable part of our family. She was again by our side in March when we needed her most. My mother-in-law, Diane Tilvern, is a strong local support for us. And of course, she was the first of our family to move to Hillary's almost 30 years ago. I could not have got here without the enormous hard work of my wonderful campaign team. And I want to pay tribute to them for all they have done for me and my family. The campaign chairman, Brent Fleeton. The deputy chair, Daniel White. The members of the Roe Bruver Club, and all of our tireless field workers, and I'll try and name all of them. I apologise if I leave anyone out. Nick Warland, Ben Moore, Alex Daniel, Christine Hamilton Prime, Adam Walker, Jessica Van Swam, Lewis Hutton, Ahmed Suleiman, Josh Hughes, Francis Hurd, Francis Hurd, Adam Ganjimi, Stefan DeSellis Clayt, Shani Kataja, Tony Brooks, Sarah Peniza, Troy Clayton, and Sandy Evangelisti. I acknowledge the great support from the Moore Division through Ian Goodenough, Kevin and Sue Fairman, Colleen Bartels, Kate Taylor, Matt Holliday and Michael Strucken. My brilliant campaign officer, Johnny Heron, was an amazing source of support and advice, as was the Liberal Party campaign team headed by Andrew Cox and Sam Calabresi, and I thank all those people. The Katzenbarnas clan certainly answered the call. I was really lucky to have my dad here. Um, I was really happy to, lucky to have my father, my son Ross and my cousin Nitsa all offering their support when it was needed most. I want to thank all of my amazing Liberal Party friends across Australia who are only too willing to lend a hand when needed. My old mate Bernie Finn, the Honourable Bernie Finn, Michael Hughes, Harry Hughes, Henry Blackater, Hamish Jones, Francis Henderson, Brent Crockford, James Duncan, Chris German and Dylan Pedersen. The solid Freedom crew was back in town for another election like they were in 2013. Extra special thanks to my former Upper House Leader, Peter Collier, for all his guidance and support, and to my friend and colleague, Liz Bajat, who proved once more that she is an absolutely brilliant campaigner. I wish her and her family every success in the future. The ongoing support from Senator Matthias Cormann and Senator Michaela Cash has been invaluable, as has the political wis wisdom of the Honourable George Cash. I, must, I also must thank one of my longest standing friends in politics, Michael Kroger. He has been by my side for more than 30 years, and I know I can count on him any time I need assistance or political wisdom. Thanks so much, Michael. I am a proud Australian, but I am also immensely proud of my Hellenic roots. Being Greek and being a Greek Orthodox Christian is they're intrinsic parts of who I am as a person. I pay special tribute to the entire Greek and Cypriot communities of Perth and Western Australia. You embraced me and my family and made us feel at home within the local Greek community when we first moved here. And you were there by my side during the election campaign. Thank you to the clergy, to the local community leaders and all the people of Greek origin who have contributed so much to this state over many generations and will continue to do so in the future. The 2017 state election needs to forever be a reminder to the Liberal Party of what happens when we lose touch with our values and how those values, when put into practice, are the best values upon which to build a better and more prosperous future for every resident of Western Australia. We must no longer be just a party of government, but a party of smaller government. We need to champion lower taxes rather than just say we will raise taxes less than the other mob will. We need to cut red tape in a meaningful way so that everyone from tradespeople and small business owners through to the volunteers at the school fete or the junior sports club canteen actually see a real reduction 
in the bewildering set of often nonsensical rules, regulations and paperwork they confront in their daily lives. We don't need to do this for ideological purity. We should do this because lower taxes and less red tape allow people to get on with making a better life for themselves and their family. They inspire business, especially small business, to grow and create more employment opportunities. More jobs means that more people get to have control of their own destiny and can proudly provide for their families. We know that over the past 200 years, free enterprise and market capitalism have been the forces that have lifted more people out of poverty than ever before and have built a more prosperous, healthier and better world. So as the party for small business, smaller government, lower taxes and less red tape, we should start promoting these values as the basis for improving the living standards of every family in the future. The Liberal Party has a proud record of helping those in society who need a hand due to age, disability or personal circumstances. But we should not build a hammock for those who don't want to pull their weight or subsidise those who simply don't need a handout. One of the most fundamental things required to build a strong, cohesive and prosperous society is the sense of safety and security in our homes, our streets, our suburbs and our towns. There is no doubt that today many people, especially the more vulnerable members of our society, do not feel as safe or as secure as they deserve to feel. The causes of crime are many and complex. But sadly, the consequences for the victims of crime are only too familiar, which is why I always unashamedly stand with law-abiding citizens and with victims of crime. I support our police who do a great job under the most difficult and confronting circumstances. I will never apologise for supporting tougher sentences for dangerous criminals who commit serious crimes, especially those crimes that hurt others. I will continue to champion mandatory minimum sentences for those offenders at the most serious end of the spectrum, such as murderers, drug traffickers, serious sex offenders, and particularly those who commit offences against our children. Although the previous Liberal government made a start by introducing mandatory jail sentences for those who assault police, there remains unfinished business, especially in relation to the most hardened, serious criminals in our society, and that includes drug traffickers. During the election campaign, the new government talked a tough game on crime. I sincerely hope they actually will be tough on crime now that they are on the Treasury benches. If they are, I will applaud and I will support them. But if, if it was just the usual political rhetoric that is quickly ditched post-election, then I will be right here holding them to task and continuing to stand up for the rights of victims of crime and law-abiding citizens. Our correction system, and especially our juvenile justice system, is an area that I would really like to make a difference in during my time in this place. We know that most crimes are committed by those who have offended before, the so-called recidivist offenders. We also know that recidivists, mo more often than not, start off by offending at the lower ends of the scale and then escalate to more serious crimes over time. Although often dismissed as a pipe dream, if we could intervene and put these people onto a different and better pathway early on, then we would reduce crime, reduce the impact of crime on our society, have far fewer victims of crime and eventually require fewer jails or detention facilities. The overall benefits to our society are obvious and clear, which is why we should not dismiss attempts to reduce reoffending, but instead support them and seek best practice. I don't have all the answers in this area and nobody else has yet come up with a fail-safe solution to stopping criminals from reoffending, but I sure know that the answer is not to let more dangerous criminals onto our streets. We won't solve the problem by throwing open the doors of our prisons and letting out offenders who the criminal justice system and our society have already determined need to be in jail. That would be our society's worst nightmare and lead to more crime and more victims. Instead, 
we do need to examine the programs put in place here in Western Australia and in other places to see what works and what doesn't, then only adopt the best practices that have been proven to give better outcomes. But at all times, we cannot lose sight of the fact that, keep, that keeping dangerous criminals behind bars is the necessary cost of keeping Western Australians safe. Sadly, when costs and government expenditure are mentioned in modern day Western Australia, the elephant in the room must be addressed. We do not get our fair share of GST. As I pointed out as far back as my first speech in the other place, in the Legislative Council, we also miss out on our fair share in nearly all types of federal funding. I said back then that we were approaching crisis point and that unless the matter was addressed, we would need to consider whether the Federation was still relevant to us. The people of Western Australia spoke loud and clear at the recent election. They no longer care about the politics, the niceties or the intricacies of GST reform. They are demanding that the problem be fixed immediately and that WA finally gets a population-based share. They don't care who fixes it or how it is fixed. They just want it fixed. Right now, federal politicians from every state need to stand up and prove that I was wrong in that first speech four years ago when I said that the problem with Canberra wasn't that they don't understand Western Australia. <clears throat> the problem was that they simply do not care about Western Australia. I don't think I need to expand on the pitfalls to be faced by those who continue with this sort of dismissive attitude. Um, Deputy Speaker, I seek an extension of time. Extension granted. Thank you. By getting our rightful share of GST, we will finally be able to genuinely improve the lives of Western Australians. During the election campaign, the people of Hillary's made it clear to me that they were extremely concerned about the opportunities that would be available to future generations. Every parent and every grandparent wants their children and grandchildren to have a better, stand in, a better standard of living than they did. That can only be achieved by ensuring that employment opportunities are abundant now and into the future, so that young people can be confident that they will be able to find and keep a job, buy a house and start their own family here in Western Australia, rather than having to go interstate or overseas. The role of government in providing such opportunities is one of the great political debates of any era, and it's been discussed for centuries. But all evidence suggests that the best way to achieve a more prosperous society is for government to get the taxation settings right and let the private sector get on with creating more jobs. So when we get our GST back, the first priority of government must be to cut job-destroying taxes like payroll tax, stamp duty and land tax. As members of parliament, we must also look at successful examples of how critical government services and infrastructure can be delivered better and more cost-effectively by the private sector. The Joondalup Health Campus in the heart of the northern suburbs is a prime example that has been delivering high quality health care to people of my electorate, including my family, for more than 20 years. The Productivity Commission uses Joondalup Health Campus as the prime example of how all Australian governments can use the private sector to reduce the ever-growing costs of the health system without compromising quality. Too often, it is said that governments are great at repeating the mistakes of the past. It is time they started replicating their successes too. Back in 2010, my family and I decided to make Western Australia our home because like so many other people who have settled here in the past decade, we worked out that this was the best place in the world to raise a family. A place where you are rewarded for your hard work with a wonderful standard of living and you become a part of a fabulous local community. In 2010, we chose Hillary's to be our local community here in Western Australia and we soon became an active part of many local groups, including playgroups, the Whitford Family Centre, 
the Sorrento Surf Life Saving Club, the Whitford's Junior Football Club and the Whitford Junior Cricket Club. As the member for Hillary's, I remain an active member of our local community and I'm an active part of all those groups and many more. But now I get the extra bonus opportunity to be so much more. I intend to be a strong and effective voice for residents of Padbury, Craigie, Sorrento, Hillary's and Kalaroo in our state parliament. Our area is generally seen as a relatively, relatively prosperous place, but we have lacked rigorous representation for far too long. This is reflected in a lack of basic state government infrastructure that other places take for granted. Our local schools do a wonderful job and are fantastic proof that independent public schools work to give better education opportunities for young people. But ageing school buildings at schools like Hillary's Primary School and Springfield Primary School can no longer simply be patched up. The 40-year-old buildings at these schools need to be rebuilt to allow the teachers and the local school community to continue their great work in modern facilities. For people who live in my local area, easing congestion is critical. Congestion costs their businesses money and even more importantly, costs them precious family time. Throughout the campaign, locals told me that the mess on the Mitchell Freeway in the mornings needs to be fixed immediately. We need an additional city-bound lane on the Mitchell between Hodges Drive and Whitford's Avenue, and we need it now. The previous government had set aside funds for this work to be done, and I call on the new government to honour this commitment because it is so vital for residents, not just in my electorate, but across the entirety of the northern suburbs. I will continue to campaign strongly for other, lo for other important local projects, such as lights for sporting ovals so that young people can remain active, and support for local early childhood centres who provide a solid foundation for lifelong learning. I will continue to advocate to keep our local streets safe through important road safety initiatives, such as improved intersections near school drop-off points, staying tough on hoons and improving cycling infrastructure. I will also fight to see the stamp duty concessions for seniors who are downsizing become a reality. This would reward our seniors for their many years of contribution to our society and at the same time will stimulate our housing market providing better choice of accommodation and making housing genuinely more affordable for new home buyers. Deputy Speaker, today I begin a new chapter serving the people of the Hillary's electorate as their local Member of Parliament. I will continue to work tirelessly to make my local area and Western Australia an even better place to live in the future. Thank you for the indulgence of the House.